as many of our it's candidates as possible. And I will tell you that, um, that Frank was represented at that meeting by Doug Nichols, uh, who made an excellent presentation. And our presence was very noted and very appreciated. And it was the first time that we had received such an invitation. So uh, I say kudos, Frank, for you making it possible for Doug to come up and, and represent you and, and our party. So without any further ado, I would like to introduce everybody to um, one of our fine candidates for governor. As you know, it's a crowded field. <laughs> Republicans don't like to narrow anything down. You know, um, we are thinking people. So uh, I would like to present to you our candidate for state governor, uh, Frank Ricks. Well, uh, unaccustomed as I am to public speaking, I think I can project out to the back. Uh, it's good to be with you. Uh, these formal proceedings with a professional parliamentarian are very impress impressive and remind me of being back in Congress, uh, although you're much more civilized. <laughs> and, and I want you to know, by the way, one, two, that... One, two, one, two. You're good. All right. And then we'll take that out. Yeah, okay. Probably a little bit better, huh? Uh, but I want you to know that, that Joy so nice to mention that Doug joined her up, up on the Hopi Reservation, but I was actually in Phoenix participating in a gubernatorial forum at the Governor's Conference on Tourism and was actually able to make the point there about the economic development benefits of some of the, the tribal nation activities and was reminded on that day that that day marked the anniversary, if you can believe this, when Native Americans were given the right to vote in our state. So just a kind of an interesting side note. I'm Frank Briggs, and y'all, Joy's right, it's a crowded primary field, but I want you to know there is a clear, proven, consistent choice for government. And that's me, as I hope you're going to agree, <laughs> after I have an opportunity to speak and, and entertain maybe some questions or comments. What? Well, how much time? Because uh, I don't want to uh, be rude to the other speakers. Do you think up to minutes? Sure, That'd be, that would be great. great. And I do have to go on. I have to, I'm expected at an event in Apache Junction, all the way out by the Superstition Mountains, and then on to Tucson, just another day in the life of a statewide candidate, right? But I'm Frank Briggs from Scottsdale up by, uh, North Scottsdale up by Cave Creek and Carefree. Uh, I was born and raised in Louisville, Kentucky, moved in my late teens to Northern California because of a job move on my dad's part, graduated high school there. Out of high school, I voluntarily enlisted in the United States Army. I'm the only veteran running for, for governor, and I salute my fellow veterans here today for their service, all 570,000 roughly of us in the state. The uh, Army asked me, what is your prior work experience? And I've been a police cadet. Pardon me for my backside, by the way. They have to move over a little bit here. Although some people say it's my better side, but no. <laughs> but the Army asked me, would you have any prior work experience? I've been a police cadet in my, in my senior year of high school, and so they assigned me to the military police. I became a military policeman, military police investigator, military police supervisor. After leaving the Army, I went into civilian law enforcement. I became a police officer, went to college on the GI Bill, got my degree, and probably most importantly, met my wife-to-be, who was a trailblazing female police officer, the only one on the department at that time. I know that doesn't sound like a romantic love story, but as a consequence, we've been blessed with three beautiful children, now all grown and married. So our expanded brood is six adult children. We have two absolutely precious grandchildren. And here is a news announcement. We are expecting our third grandchild this Thursday. And we're calling, and we're calling that grandchild, good Lord willing, of course, baby Rigsy, because our son Matt and his wife, our daughter-in-law, Erin, have decided to make it a surprise. So we don't know whether we're going to get a boy or a girl. We're simply referring to the new grandchild as Baby Rigsy, native-born Arizona. So really, you can't tell how excited I am, Tim. Um, I, uh, I spent about seven years in law enforcement. Kathy actually spent longer. She never fails to remind me that she had seniority and that she made detective before I did. Um, but, you know, that's, that's part of the course because she is the boss and she's been my partner in, in everything in life. And I left law enforcement to go into private business. I discovered I was really an entrepreneur at heart. I built 
uh, from the ground up to very successful real estate and outdoor advertising businesses, got involved in the community, ran for the school board, became school board president. I was Little League president, I was Chamber of Commerce president, in fact, I think I was all three in the same year. So that's what they mean when they say all politics are local. And like you, because you are the backbone of the party here in Coconino County, I got involved in local Republican Party politics. And in 1982, I was invited back to Washington, D.C., got to meet Ronald Reagan in the Oval Office. I don't know why I was invited. Some people said, well, it was a gathering for kind of rising Republican leaders. I was so awestruck, I think I was able to get my name out when it came my turn to shake his hand and have a photograph taken. But he was a tremendous inspiration. He encouraged me to stay actively involved in the party and consider, consider running for elective office, which I did in 1990. I tried to recruit another candidate to step forward and run for Congress against a four-term, eight-year Democrat incumbent in a congressional district where Democrats have almost a 20-point registration advantage. But that Democrat incumbent had been tainted by the savings and loan scandal. He had been associated with two failed savings and loans. It turned out he received preferential treatment from those organizations that failed and had to be bailed out by the federal taxpayer in the form of sweetheart loans. So, when I was unable to recruit any other candidate, I stepped forward, ran against him, and defeated him, and won election to Congress. As they said later, a real-life Mr. Smith. I went back to Washington, I actually campaigned on the slogan of send a tough cop to Congress, and went back to Washington, D.C., and I was immediately called the stealth candidate, because nobody had given me a chance of winning. And I didn't show up on the radar screen, nobody returned my phone calls. In fact, I was talking yesterday, our victory celebration may have gone in, you know, into the wee hours, and at some point, I think somebody broke out something that was 125 proof. As the realization set in, my goodness, I've just been elected a United States congressman. So I finally got to sleep about 5 a.m. And a few minutes later, the phone started ringing because it was 8 o'clock East Coast time with all my newfound friends who were telling me to get up and start making phone calls and raising money. And so I realized I wasn't going to get any sleep. I got up, took a shower. Kathy came into the, to the, to the bathroom the master bathroom, very, very excited, holding the phone extension and mouthing the words, it's the White House calling. And so I took the phone from her and I heard the White House operator say, uh, Congressman Riggs, nobody had called me that to that point. She said, please hold for the president. You're almost attempted, attempted to ask the president of what, right? <laughs> and, I, and I started to, to, to and, you know, I had the phone in my hand, started to do the conversation, and Kathy said, don't you dare talk to the president of the United States without putting on a towel first. So... <laughs> But I got back to Washington, D.C., and here, here's a shocking revelation, discovered that there was corruption in Congress. And I organized with six other Republican freshmen what came to be known as the Gang of Seven, seven Republican freshmen, including my good friend Rick Santorum, who's endorsed me in the race for, for governor. Uh, we were seven Republican freshmen in the minority party, so the lowest form of life in Washington, D.C. But we exposed the House Bank and Post Office candles. A lot of people give us credit for paving the way for the Contract with America, the Republican takeover of Congress in 1994, newly elected Speaker Newt Gingrich asked me to introduce the first bill from the Contract with America, the Congressional Accountability Act, which simply said that Congress has to live under the very laws that it imposes on the American people. That was the law of the land until last year, when our current president is one of 38 changes he's made unilaterally, and in my opinion, uh, in, in, in violation of his constitutional oath, to the national law that carries his name, decided to exempt the members of Congress, their staff, and the White House staff from the provisions, the mandates of Obamacare. I went on to compile a consistently conservative voting record in that district and won re-election twice. A voting record that earned me the highest ratings and the endorsements of National Right to Life for my pro-family, pro-life voting record, and from the NRA for my strong support of the Second Amendment. When I left Congress in 1998 and for three terms to keep my term limits commitment, because I still think elective office should be short-term public service, not a career. I think career politics and politicians are the root cause of so many of the problems that we have as a country today. But when I left Congress in 1998, the federal budget was balanced, and it generated surpluses for four consecutive years thereafter. We had also fundamentally reformed welfare by imposing time limits and work requirements on able-bodied welfare recipients. We made good on our promises. We passed that legislation. Bill Clinton, President Clinton, vetoed it several times before finally signing it into law when he was running for re-election in 1996. But we accomplished what we set out to accomplish, and we made divided government work. My last votes as a member of Congress 
in December of 1998 were on the articles of impeachment against Bill Clinton, not for carrying on an immoral and scandalous affair with a White House intern, but for lying and perjuring himself before a federal grand jury and, and fundamentally breaching his constitutional oath. So folks, I'm here today to introduce myself to you. When I became a candidate right after the first of the year, the, the, the wagging tongues, the chattering class down in Phoenix said, well, he's the most impressive candidate that you've never heard of. And you may have that same opinion, but we're slowly changing that. Now I'm being called the dark horse in the governor's race because people are sitting up and are paying attention and are really beginning to study the candidates and their, and their records. And my record stands out. My record stands out because of the oath that I took when I volunteered to serve my country in the United States Army, the law enforcement oath of honor that I took when I pinned on the badge, the same oath that my wife and Kathy, Kathy took to protect and serve the public, the, the oath that I took when I was sworn into Congress to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And like I said, I left Congress after three terms, resumed my life in the private sector, and for the last 16 years have been focused on expanding educational opportunity and parental school choice, building from the ground up the largest organization in the country, a community development financial institution from here in Arizona to help charter schools, public charter schools, with their facility financing and development needs, and then starting and serving as the first volunteer board president of a statewide online charter school that offers an accredited curriculum to homeschooling families. That's been my passion, my driving interest, but I'm off the sidelines and back in the arena in part because Kathy said stop complaining and talking back to the TV and get involved with this. <laughs> but because we need strong, proven leadership at the helm. I got an email a couple of days ago from a good friend and supporter. And he asked me very, very bluntly, because we are good friends and he knows he, you know, he can communicate this way. He basically said, what I want to know so I can tell other people is do you have the guts to make the tough decisions? To reclaim our state, get our state, get our country back on track. And, and what he was really saying is, how do I know I can trust you to make the tough but right decisions? And I simply said, look at my record. It's deep. It's proven. I'm tested. I'm trusted. I'm not, you know, I'm running against a couple candidates, the wealthy candidates, who are blank slates. Absolute blank slates. They've never had to cast a single tough legislative vote. They can make it up as they go, right? I mentioned my last votes as a member of Congress on well, the articles of impeachment against Bill Clinton. My very first votes as a member of Congress in January 1991 were on the first Persian Gulf War resolution. It's a deep, proven record. You can Google me, and it's all out there. But it's a record I'm very, very proud of. So I'm running for governor of Arizona because we need a tough, experienced, proven leader at the helm. And while I want to make our state less, not more dependent on the federal government, I think it would be a good thing for Arizona's next governor to have a background and successful experience serving in Congress, knowing how to get things done in D.C. I'd have immediate credibility and respect with the Arizona congressional delegation and with congressional leadership as a whole, because again, they know of me and my record. John Boehner, Speaker Boehner, was also one of the gang of seven. That's how far back I go with them. So I said, and I'm giving you my word today, no different than the oath that I took, when I put on the uniform, when I pinned on the badge, when I was sworn into Congress, that I'm going to stop the federal government overreach and I'm going to end the Obamanization of Arizona. And what do I mean by that? I'm going to use the executive authority of the governor's office to repeal Arizona's participation in Common Core on day yes. one. Yes. And I'm the only candidate that will say that. I am the only candidate. We've done something like 40 forums so far. And the other candidates give lip service. They say they oppose Common Core, but they won't commit to getting rid of it. In fact, just the other night, a couple nights ago, I spoke in Mesa at LB25, the largest legislative district in the state. I preceded Mr. Ducey. I said, you mark my words. I, you've heard from me. You know what I stand for. When it comes to his turn, ask him his position on Common Core. And note that he won't commit to getting rid of it. And sure enough, somebody asked him the question. He said, I oppose Common Core, and then danced completely around the subject. Ken Bennett has taken me aside. And Ken Bennett's a nice guy, good man, but he's taking me inside and said, Frank, you don't understand. We can't get rid of Common Core because it's been adopted by the State Board of Education, and the State Board of Education is a constitutionally created body. And I said, no, Ken, you don't understand. 
Those individuals are appointed by the governor, subject to confirmation by the state senate, and I'm going to demand the resignation of every single member of the state board of education that voted to adopt Common Core. That's what leadership is about. What, what purpose is there in seeking the highest elected office in our state if you're not willing to provide the leadership that the people expect? And particularly now, when our state and our country are in crisis, I'm reminded of what Dr. Franklin said when he walked out of the Constitutional Convention, right? He was approached by Mrs. Powell. And what did she say? Well, Dr. Franklin, what have we got? A monarchy or a republic? And what did he famously say? A republic if we can keep it. And that challenge as to whether we can keep our republic is greater today than at any time in our country's history since the Civil War because of the lawlessness of this president and his administration. How else do you explain the chief law enforcement officer of the United States, Attorney General Eric Holder, saying with respect to the border surge and all the illegal immigrant minors, right, coming into Texas, so many are being transferred to, to, and detained in our state, how else do you explain him saying, we have to help these children fight deportation? What does that do for respect for the rule of law in a nation of laws? We've got to have a strong, proven, determined governor at the helm that will push back against this administration. I also understand, because I want to be a governor, that I would have the responsibility, I'd be the de facto head, if you'll let me, of being the head of our state Republican Party. And by the way, that means I'm accountable to you, not the other way around. I've held high legislative office. I'm the only candidate that has served in the United States Congress, the highest legislative body in our land, as dysfunctional as it is today. But that experience, taught me what it meant to be accountable to 600,000 constituents. And I went before them repeatedly. I put myself on the line because I believe in servant leadership and I understand at the end of the day, I'm accountable to the people that I represent and that I serve. And, then, and that those people, my constituents, are the bosses. So I understand that I would be the head of the state Republican Party. And you know what that means? I'll never do what this governor did which is to take a page out of Janet Napolitano's playbook, line up Democrats in lockstep behind me, peel off a handful of Republican votes, and pass something as sweeping and onerous as Medicaid expansion under Obamacare in the dead of the night. It is not sustainable. The Heritage Foundation says that it will cost state taxpayers, that means you and me, $2.8 billion to continue Medicaid expansion from now to the year 2022. And that's not that far away, right? So I am committed to rolling back Medicaid expansion for able-bodied, working-age, childless adults, the same way that we reformed the federal welfare system. I also want to protect Medicare. And the Congressional Budget Office says that Obamacare will take $1 trillion out of Medicare over the next decade, including $200 billion from Medicare Advantage, which 25% of Medicare recipients use. I fought a bruising battle as a member of Congress. I think I still have the scars to show for it, to try to reform and strengthen and protect Medicare and put it on long-term, sound financial footing. And I'll be darned if I'm going to be a party to any kind of a program like Obamacare that raids $1 trillion from Medicare over the next decade to pay for those Obamacare subsidies, including Medicaid expansion, here in Arizona. So I'm saying that I will stop the Obamization of Arizona by repealing Common Core, stopping the expansion of Medicaid, and I'll fix the state budget mess. We've got a looming fiscal cliff of our own as a state, and I'll get our economy going again to create jobs. And that means, by the way, attending to the needs of rural Arizona as well. The congressional district I represented was 450 miles long from one end to the other. It was largely rural in nature. It was home to all a part of four federal forests, national forests. So I understand the needs and concerns of rural communities. I fought a running battle with the extreme environmental interests, who, by the way, labeled me one of the dirty dozen, which I wore as a badge of honor. <laughs> but I took on Earth First. When I won re-election to Congress, it was on a slogan of Jobs First, not Earth First, because Earth First, radical environmental organizations, had been associated with tree spikings, car bombings, and in 1998, ransacked my congressional district office, unfortunately when I wasn't present, but with big guys running into my office wearing ski masks and terrorizing my all-female staff. 
So I have stood up. I fought that battle. I've organized the Western members of Congress as the Western Caucus to force the U.S. Forestry Department, the Department of Agriculture, to permit road construction, to conduct salvage logging sales, to do selective harvesting for the help of the forest and for fire suppression purposes. I'll never lose sight of the needs and concerns of the more rural communities of, of Arizona because I want to be a governor for all of Arizona and I will always put Arizona first. One other thing, because it's top of mind, obviously, and that's the board situation. I ask you, look at the candidates and ask yourself, who is best prepared to fulfill the responsibility of Commander-in-Chief of the Arizona National Guard? That's one of the responsibilities of the office. One candidate, one candidate alone, is a military veteran, voluntarily stepped forward, enlisted in the Army, served my country, put on the uniform, and in both the Army and in law enforcement, literally put my life on the line to serve my fellow man. One candidate, one candidate alone has done that. One candidate, one candidate alone has law enforcement experience. So I think I'm prepared for that responsibility as well. And I have said, as a member of Congress, I helped get the funding to build the fence on California's border with Mexico, which now extends into the U.S. sector of our border, which is relatively secure. It's the Tucson sector, of course, of the border that's wide open, is the corridor for all of the human smuggling and drug trafficking, and now this enormous border surge, the, the immigrants coming from Central America, not because conditions are so bad in those countries, but because the word is out in those countries. Right? right. The, and, and the magnet, of course, are the amnesty policies, lax border security, and lenient deportation procedures of the Obama administration. We're not heartless as Americans. Did you know that last year, we sent $400 million in humanitarian aid to those Central American countries. Those are your federal tax dollars. Last year, we gave Mexico $300 million in federal taxpayer funding earmarked, if you can believe this, for drug interdiction and for the training technology and equipment for Mexican law enforcement entities at the federal and state level. Has that been money well spent, more precious than expressed? With that $700 million go a long ways towards building the appropriate barrier on the Tucson sector of the border, and then and then you know making sure that we have the necessary manpower and equipment to permanently secure that border as a matter of national security, which is the highest priority of the federal government, especially since 9/11, since we have to know who's in our country and who's coming and going. But it's also the highest priority of state government. Yes. Public safety and health is the highest priority of state government, and I'm prepared to meet that responsibility head on. So I've said I'll deploy the National Guard. I'll ask one time, one time only, uh, because you know, our National Guard was federalized as part of the War on Terror. And the National Guard was deployed and, re and redeployed to Afghanistan and Iraq. But we've withdrawn from Iraq. We're supposedly going to completely withdraw from Afghanistan. We no longer need our National Guard in those combat theaters. And they're far more needed here at home to help secure the border once and for all. And securing the border is crucial to restoring any kind of relationship with Mexico. Mexico's our leading international trade partner. They're our neighbors, and they're huge influence on us to this day in terms of our culture, our history as Arizonans. We want a good relationship with them, but we can't have a good relationship with them until they become a reliable partner and national security ally by securing their side of the 2,000 mile international border that we share. So I hope, ladies and gentlemen, you agree. I'm ready to do this job. I'm ready to do it on day one. Unlike maybe some of my other competitors, I'm not. I'm, you know, obviously, I, I think I've been tested, trusted, proven. I'm about to turn 64. I've been blessed with great health. I'm in great shape because I work real hard on it, at it. But I'm not going back into the arena just because Kathy told me I should. <laughs> or because of the concern that I have for the generations of my children and grandchildren. And I'm really worried about that, by the way. Yeah. I'm incredibly worried. Mm -hmm. I go out and talk with young people, and there's this widespread cynicism and apathy in the land. There's this despair that their, their future's not, not going to be as good. How did we arrive at this point? It's incredible, right? And we inherited from our founding fathers this health, healthy skepticism about government, but there's a fine line between that and the corrosive cynicism that eats at our system of participatory democracy in a constitutional republic. So I'm stepping forward 
I'm ready to serve, but I'm not looking to go into politics, back into politics for the long term. I'm not looking at the next office. I'm looking at making the tough but right decisions that are necessary to reclaim our state, that our destiny is a state, our destiny is a country, and get things moving in the right direction again. And I promise you this, I'll always be guided by the conservative values that unite us as Republicans. The conservative values that I'll take to the governor's office of fiscal responsibility, constitutionally limited government, free markets because free markets work, equal opportunity but not equal outcome, <laughs> secure borders, and personal responsibility. That will be the foundation on which we will reclaim our future, our destiny as a state, and make our state a model for the rest of the country. Thank you very much. We'll want to give Frank a few minutes for questions, and I, I'd kind of like to ask the first question. I think that's the problem of the chair. Uh, I'm wondering how Arizona can secure its borders and prevent this immigration, you know, uh, crisis from continuing when we have an administration that doesn't value states' rights and will merely lease people after we have, you know. Uh, captured them. How, how can we fight the feds is my question. Very good question from Joy. You know, at that LD25 meeting in Mesa, Congressman Matt Salmon, who's a friend, former colleague, just went in, Matt and his wife Nancy, who are good friends at Kathy Meet, came to the meeting. Matt said he had just returned from a congressional delegation to Honduras and El Salvador, and that they met with the, first, the president of both those countries. And you know what he said, the president said? He said, we want our kids back. Send them back. And they're coming here, again, not because of the conditions in that country so much as the word is out that it's possible, just as Joy suggested, to come into our country illegally, assimilate, you know, stay indefinitely, and maybe even, ultimately, get amnesty allowing you to become an American citizen. Undermining the rule of law, respect for the law in a nation of law. What can the governor do? Well, the governor, first of all, can use the bully pulpit, and it would help if the governor, as a former United States congressman, knows how to talk the talk and walk the talk as well, number one. Number two, I would handle things very differently. I was the only governor, gubernatorial candidate that went down to Oracle earlier this week, a very rural, isolated community on the outskirts of Tucson. Why did I go there? To take a stand with the proud and patriotic Arizonans, and especially the residents of that community, who were saying, no, it is incredibly inappropriate and risky, even dangerous, to bring these illegal immigrant minors who have been detained. And, and by the way, they don't come into the country volunteering whether they have any criminal history. They don't come into the country bearing any kind of medical records. Yet we were going to place them in a YMCA day camp. I mean, it's, it's incredible to me. They have to be quarantined. And we had created a facility on the border in the Gallus, a, a converted warehouse, manned by the Border Patrol. By the way, a whole bunch of Border Patrol agents who've been moved off the border to provide, you know, to run, you know, provide security, run that, that facility, daycare. I think that's what Matt Salmon called it. He, called it. he said to babysit, right? But that's where those young people should go. Now there's work that they're going to be bused to places like, like Wisconsin. I mean, this is a conscious strategy on the part of this president and his administration. No two ways about it. So, what would I have done? I, and I believe Governor Brewer when she says that she had no advance notice. But I would have, I would have asked the American Red Cross to, to respond to the humanitarian crisis. And I frankly would have, I would have provided whatever state resources are necessary to make sure that those detainees were quarantined. That they can't mingle in Arizona society and put at risk the health and possibly the safety of our citizens, period, in the discussion. We will also make sure that we have the appropriate interior enforcement in Arizona. A couple weeks ago, in fact, three weeks ago today, I believe, I was in Sierra Vista, met with Cochise County Sheriff Mark Gamels, really good man, a cop's cop, and we had that cop-to-cop -cop talk, and he said, Frank, you're not going to believe it, but our communications equipment doesn't work right here. We need a modern 911 dispatch system. We can't talk on an agency-to-agency -agency basis. He, believe it or not, he, 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 uh, he had just finished a helicopter tour of the border, but that was courtesy of Howard Buffett, Warren Buffett's son, who has an experimental farm 
in modern agricultural production techniques in Cochise County and who pr provided $6 million for that department to buy a helicopter because they couldn't wait for the state, the governor and the state legislature to get around to it, right? So we can provide a lot more resources to local law enforcement and then we can enforce our interior laws. I'm proud to tell you today that I have the endorsement of Russell Pierce, former state senator Russell Pierce, former state senate president Russell Pierce, and the author of SB 1070. Russell was the chief deputy for Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio. And that SB 1070 is good law. It's good law. It simply says you can't, you, you learn in the first week in the police academy that you don't, you have to enforce all laws. You don't have the discretion to decide to enforce this law, but not enforce that law, right? So, SB 1070 simply says that if you as a local law enforcement have probable cause, a reasonable cause to detain someone, and then you have probable cause to believe that they're an illegal immigrant, that they're in our country in violation of federal immigration law, that you have a duty to then arrest them, right? And so if you stop someone, let's just say for a traffic violation, they're operating a motor vehicle, they don't have identification, that itself is a violation of Arizona state laws, I hope everybody here knows. But then if you, if you pursue further, and they cannot provide any identification, any proof that they're in the country legally, then you have probable cause to believe that they're here illegally. You, have, you, sh you, you should take action under SB 1070, and that's why it's good law. So we have to do a much, it's a long way away, Joy, so we have to do a much better job of helping lo local law enforcement, including our Border County Sheriff, secure the border, combat border related to crime, but we also have to, to on a state, local level, we have to enforce all laws, including federal immigration laws, in the interior of Arizona as well. Other questions, comments? Yes, ma'am. Okay, as a public lands rancher, what is your stance on the concept uh, that's being, that's being talked about in the West of um, having our federal lands under the guise of the BLM Forest Service? return to the provenance of the states? I love to appreciate the question, absolutely. I very strongly support the American Lands Council proposal that those lands, are, and, and notice I'm going to say public lands, notice I'm not going to say federal lands, because they were supposed to be held in trust by the federal government for our state. Never got around, obviously, to transferring those lands to us. But they'd be transferred to Arizona. It's, it's no different than education or health care. You know, we do not want need Liberal elites are bureaucrats in the federal government back east telling us how to educate our kids, how to provide indigent health care to the truly needy, desperately poor, nor how to manage the public lands in Arizona. In fact, to the contrary, they put those public lands off limits. They've locked them up from any productive use because of the extreme environmental organizations. They're, they're treated, I, I don't want to use the word managed, they're, they're treated as preserved for all kinds of critical habitat. It's, it's absurd. Those lands were intended to be used for productive purposes. Our traditional resource industries, energy development, recreation. But again, now all off limits. Give them to us. Let's, I'm going to go to the Arizona congressional delegation and say, please introduce a bill, get it going in the House, and force it over to the Senate. If it dies there because of Harry Reid, and hopefully we put him in the, we put him in the minority come November, at least we are we are putting down a placeholder, a marker, saying we want our lands, we can do a far better job of managing them for multiple uses and for productive purposes. Matt Salmon, by the way, also told me that Harry Reid has 300 House passed bills, 300 bills passed by the Republican congressional majority in the House in his desk. We have got to get rid of that guy, or at a minimum, relegate him from majority leader of the Senate where he runs the whole show back to minority leader, even though he'll be just as obstructionist, or attempt to be, as minority leader as he is today as majority leader. That's for sure. Yes, sir? Uh, from what I'm hearing, I'm hearing political solutions. What actions are you going to take to protect the existence of Arizona as a state, um, as the federal government pretty much has a target on Arizona? We see this with Fast and Furious, the illegal immigration uh, being dumped on the borders, uh, federal lands being close to us, the Grand Canyon, um, this past, uh, like, when they went through their budget negotiations, flouncing um, of drug laws, what are you going to do to protect Arizona? I'm going to put Arizona first. I think I've spoken to a lot of them. And, and they are, they are, they are very much political. 
That's how our process works. It is a political process, and you do acknowledge that, right? And, and, and I don't want to give you the impression today that I, I as governor, I have unlimited authority. I, I, I would, and you wouldn't want that. You wouldn't want a governor that says they can take unilateral action. Because that would potentially threaten our, our liberties, our freedoms. You know, I served in Congress, again, the only candidate who serves in the highest legislative body in our country. And I understand that the legislative branch of government is a co-equal partner with the executive branch of government. In fact, the legislative branch of government can impose restraints on the executive branch of government under the checks and balances in both our federal and state constitution. But I do appreciate the question, sir. I'm going to be as, as bold and forceful as possible. I'm going to have given a legal analysis on any new proposed law or regulation as to whether or not it constitutes an unfunded mandate imposed on Arizona by the federal government. Perfect example are the new EPA regulations requiring further reduction right, in coal and carbon dioxide emissions as part of the continuing, this administration's continuing war on coal, trying to force everything to alternative clean energy. It's absurd. The biggest impact, of course, is going to be on NGS, not O generating stations, you very well know. Principal source of living wage jobs in the Navajo tribal nation, but with a downstream effect on all of the users and ratepayers of all, the, all electrical and power systems. This fund was on the hills 18 months ago. All of those entities that own NGS or you know, use power generators, they voluntarily agreed to implement new regulations to reduce particulate haze, you know, in, and improve air visibility, presumably in the vicinity of the Grand Canyon. Now, right on the hill, there's no way you can ever satisfy the appetite of the regulatory beast. And in, in my experience, the environmental organizations never negotiate in good faith. They never do. You might reach, you think you might reach an order and they move the bar again, you know, on and on and on. So, so we're going to stand up to them. We're going to get an analysis as to whether or not it constitutes an unfunded mandate. And if it constitutes an unfunded mandate, we're going to try we're either to get an injunction, go to court, get an injunction, so we can stand up and say, no. You, you do not have the legal authority to impose this new regulatory mandate on Arizona because it, you, you're not providing the funding to do it. Under the new EPA regulations, they say, by the way, oh, it's voluntary. Voluntary. All Arizona has to do to comply with these regulations is adopt its own cap-and-trade regime, or it can partner with neighboring states to implement a cap-and-trade regime. That, that's absurd. So I'm going to be as, you know, again, firm, bold, as, as possible, and try to use all the resources at my disposal as governor, and, and, and in partnership with the state legislature. I'm, I'm convinced we, we have a good, solid, working majority in the state legislature. Where did Bob go? Bob Thorpe. Well, there he is. <laughs> Bob didn't realize me without your hat. But, but Bob is a, a perfect example of a principled conservative, a leader in his own right in the state legislature. He's the kind of colleague and partner that I know I can work with. Uh, so, and I, I know he and I are on the same page. So we, we will present, am I right about this, Bob? A united front in opposing the constant expansion of the federal government, the overreach of the Obama administration, this expansion of the size, the scope, the reach, the power, the cost of the federal government. Because to your point, sir, it, it has an incredibly detrimental impact on the lives of Arizonans, and it, and it represents the constant erosion of state rights and state sovereignty under the 10th Amendment. Um, unless we have any burning questions left for Frank, um, I'm do, do we? Any of it must go away. Um, Frank. Website. Website. Uh, website, please. Riggs, R I G G S, 4 A Z Gov dot com. Right? My uh, my far more handsome, better looking impersonator, uh, <laughs> Doug Nickel, is going to stay around. Uh, so to hopefully, to answer any questions, give you more information, see if uh, he can persuade a few of you fine folks, or the great majority of you fine folks, to take a sign. Uh, but I would really appreciate your help, your support, your consideration. Like I said, in a crowded primary field, there is a clear, proven, consistent conservative choice for governor, a leader who's ready to take that home and can do the job from day one. Thanks so much, everybody. I appreciate it.